Hello, uh, welcome to MD Media's uh, episode two of On Peace and Conflict Thermometer. This episode two, we started this uh, three weeks ago with uh, Professor Shettle Trombol, and it's uh, my great pleasure again to have him back for episode two. And this uh, show is mainly designed uh, in such a way that uh, viewers send us questions in advance and uh, Professor Shettle, who is the Professor of Peace and Conflict in Oslo, um, and his uh, specialty is in the Horn of Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, all that. And he answers these questions on this show live every second Sunday. So today we are back, and uh, Shettle, welcome again. Thank you so much, my friend. It's a pleasure being here with you. Awesome. So. Um, because this is the second one, uh, maybe I think we are setting another format how we start the show uh, whenever we come. So the first ep- the first part would be a recap of the thermometer of the horn, so to speak. So how how did you assess what what, what happened in terms of the highlights since our last show? Yes, there has been some significant. Um at least significant interviews, significant statements, not necessarily significant events. And I think we should touch upon three of these interviews or statements by the three, possibly by the three most prominent individuals in Ethiopian politics these days, uh, Jawar Mohammed and uh, Abiy Ahmed and uh, the Bretzion in Tigray. All these three have uh, issued statements and uh, and interviews, which are uh, changing some of the political discourse we see in the country and the region. So let's just briefly go through and touch upon the the, the content of uh, what these gentlemen have uh, said. Let's start with Jawar. Uh, many people have um, expressed uh, great deal of excitement and curiosity of what he would say in his first official public appearance after he was released from prison earlier this year. And um, he gave a lengthy interview um, uh, on on a TV channel, Ethiopian TV channel, but he has also now over the last couple of weeks been traveling internationally in Europe. He also visited Oslo briefly. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet him in person and had a lengthy talk with him. And he is continuing his Europe tour before he will cross over to US and giving then um, public uh, appearance meetings with the uh, Orumo diaspora across Europe and um, and US to come. And uh, the, the first interview he made he touched upon several issues of some which created quite a controversy among his own base, so to say, among his own followers. Um, First of all, I have to say it is quite remarkable in many ways that um, a person being arrested for um, on political reasons uh, and being put in jail for more than a year and a half um, one would assume when such a person is released uh, that he or she might have become even more politically radicalized in prison, even more kind of um, confrontational uh, against the regime which put him away in the first place. But Jawar appeared from prison and he's speaking now with a much more moderate voice than he had before he was imprisoned Um a year, almost two years ago now. And um, I think that uh, we should keep that in mind and that's quite admirable in many ways. But let's go to the controversial issues he has phrased, which have, well, controversial issues among many Orumos, at least. Um, But he is um, preaching the gospel of peace, which is good, which is fine. I think all Ethiopians, no matter your background, is striving to establish peace in the country. But then on what basis or what strategies and what policies and what concessions should lead to peace? That is the key issues discussed. Um, And I think uh, Mr. Javar, he 
by calling for peace and at the same time rejecting and creating a distance to anyone using arms to pursue political objectives. By doing so, it was an implicit or maybe even explicit criticism of the Oromo Liberation Army and its struggle to uh, represent the Oromos in, um, to change the government in Oromo region and in Ethiopia. And uh, which we know is an intense uh, struggle ongoing as we speak with um, atrocities happening in uh, Wolega and other places across Oromia. So by criticizing the use of an armed struggle to achieve political objectives, Javar also then distancing himself from the OLA by, since they are an armed actor in Ethiopia today. And I think that's something which came as a, as a surprise to many Oromos. Um, he also issued comments or he, he, he commented upon uh, the role of Eritrea, for instance, in Ethiopian politics, which came, uh, which was quite an, um, uh, raised some eyebrows in Tigray at least, but I think also in other places of Ethiopia, that he said that Eritrea has a natural stake in Ethiopian political affairs, as similar to that Ethiopia has a natural stake in Eritrean political affairs. And of course, this is an attitude or a perspective which is, um, you know, which many uh, Habesha or uh, or uh, greater Ethiopian thesis, so to say, advocates that uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia are not two separate countries. They are linked together by a common history and culture and, and politics. And hence, their status today should not be designed according to international relations, but should be looked upon as an intimacy, a political intimacy, which grants each government a natural right <laughs> to interfere into each other's business. And that's that's um, a bit puzzling when it comes from Javar. It is more, um, we have heard the same voices, so to say, from more pan-Ethiopian nationalists uh, wanting to bring Eritrea back to the motherland and so on. So, so it's a bit... Um, confusing for some how to interpret that. Also, it was a quite uh, critical remarks from Tigray that, um, that Javar didn't mention, didn't stress, didn't emphasize the atrocities having taken place in Tigray during the last, you know, 18 months of warfare. Um, that was kind of don't play. Javar asked for certainly for peace with Tigray. Javar said that it is essential that TPLF is included in a national dialogue to create that peace, but without stressing um, uh, accountability measures for the atrocities taking place, for instance. So I think um, the challenge now for Javar is to sell his new gospel <laughs> to his audience, which primarily is, of course, the Oromo constituency. And we have seen since the interview and since also he has started on his international tour, a number of very critical questions are raised against him by his audience, saying uh, partly accusing him for um, leaving uh, or abandoning the Oromo cause in this struggle. I think um, it is a very bold repositioning Javar has taken. And I, I personally, I can admire him for doing so. I'm a bit afraid, however, that by moving towards the center of Ethiopian politics, by muting the Oromo first rhetoric, he might um, distancing himself from his base. And um, that might be troubling for him. What kind of role will he play if he is not a strong or staunch Oromo voice in the politics of Ethiopia. But we have to keep in mind that he is not, um, you know, he's representing Oromo Federalist Congress. Um, and um, 
Merera Gudina, the, the chairman of and the founding father of OFC, has always been at the center, in, you can say, in interpreting Ethiopian politics, believing that the Oromos are an integral part of Ethiopia, uh, rejecting any kind of claim of succession and independence of Oromia. Um, so uh, Javar is, is following up the party politics, you may say, and saying that if, um, you know, in the long term perspective, uh, if um, Ethiopia become a democratic state, well, the Oromos will have the main hold on power because of their demographic weight. Um, I think um, it, is a, it is a very interesting uh, situation that uh, Javar has, uh, has kind of repositioned himself and, um, and the party even closer to the, to the center of Ethiopian politics and has in, possibly in many's eyes become um, what, what we used to call a loyal opposition. <laughs> an opposition, uh, you know, critical to the power at the palace, but still willing to talk to the power at the palace and, and to negotiate with them and to nudge them forward in, in the possible direction. Mm. So um, that's Javar, uh, very briefly. Uh, he said a lot of things. Uh, Maybe uh, a lot of things. Before we jump to another one uh, on Javar, because you mentioned OFC, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, how that's playing out. Uh, I just want to mention, given that yesterday was their first tour to the North, North America in Minnesota. Minnesota is the Oromia of, uh, I think, the world outside Oromia, I would say. Minnesota, uh, yeah. Exactly. And uh, here is uh, somebody saying, because what is unique in uh, what happened in uh, Minnesota or from now on is, who will be touring with Bekele Garba? Yeah. And this is a tweet this morning uh, on what happened in Minnesota. This uh, account is saying, contrary to Jawar Muhammad's elitist, detached, and unsympathetic takes on current Oromo politics so far, Bekele Gerba's speech in Minnesota today was calm, he's referring to yesterday, and reserved. He spoke about the suffering going on in Oromia, centered and reassured his constituencies Oromo. So I'm just wondering, Maybe I don't want to make a lot out of one tweet, but is this something that maybe within the OFC even Jawar has his own track, maybe not shared by Bakala and the others, or is this uh, something maybe not? Yeah, much? I think I think uh, here you know this is the this is the dual track if to use your analogy or or the tensions as other has characterized it between Bekele Garba and um, and Merera Gudina's positions earlier that they have spoken being part of the same party as chair and vice chair but they've spoken to with a bit different tone with a bit different language with a diff, bit different um, possibly political interpretations to the same constituency and that's you know strategically that's very wise of the party that you have um, you have a more moderate center uh, and then you have some individuals at the very top level of the party who speaks more to the directly to the concern of its core constituency not necessarily speaking on ethiopian affairs as javar now is turning to do more than, and Bekele then will will maintain the communication, may will maintain uh, the interpretation of the core Rumo grievances, so to say. And um, so I, I have I have not managed to look into the, the the first speech in Minnesota by by the two gentlemen, so I have to catch up on that. But but I think it, it follows in the track we have seen earlier, but the the the, the role played by Merera and uh, and Bekele. Now Merera Javar have a more a similar voice possibly, and Bekele maintains his position, which I think is very strategically wise, in order to try to reharness or recapture the imagination of the Oromo grassroots. And we have to keep in mind there are ongoing atrocities as we speak and, and, and uh, insurgents war taking place in Oromia. 
with, uh, with casualties every day, both civilian Oromos and, and also OLA fighters. So it is important, obviously, for any Oromo party to raise those concerns. Great. You may continue with that. Yeah, let's let's jump forward. Uh, we have other we have other questions to to take care of too. But then um, Abi Ahmed's speech in Parliament some few days back, which is noteworthy uh, in the sense that he, for the first time, publicly recognized the need to negotiate with the TPLF. Also noteworthy here that he said TPLF, not the junta. Uh, kind of accepting that war now in in public war is not the answer to the Tigrayan issue, as has been the formal policy until more or less today. Then officially, we know of of course that uh, since early this year, when uh, Abiy Ahmed's government declared a unilateral humanitarian truce which was reciprocated by the Tigrayan government. Um, we have known that there has been indirect talks between Mekele and Addis. But, you know, still the formal position of the government had been that, you know, the, um, a militarized strategy. Although there has been no significant clashes between the Tigrayan Defense Forces and the ENDF since February this year. Then Abi said that the Prosperity Party has established a committee led by uh, Deputy Prime Minister Demeke Mekonen uh, to look into what needs to be done to maintain peace in the country. And that this committee should study and investigate on what conditions to negotiate with the TPLF. What, co what conditions should be put in place in order for the government to start direct negotiations with TPLF. So um, that is, in a way, a great step forward, officially recognizing the need to establish a negotiation track with what is still characterized uh, by the federal government as a terrorist group. TPLF was designated a terrorist group. Now the government says we need to find the conditions and the context necessarily in order to start negotiating with them. We don't know what these conditions or preconditions will be from the government side, but surely they are nudging forward to a more direct negotiation. And then we see that speech in Parliament um, relating to the Brezion's um, letter, open letter to um, AU and uh, President uh, Kenyatta and President Samia of Tanzania. And also then De Brezion held a long interview on um, a press conference uh, on, on uh, Tigray television, also elaborating on the Tigray government's stand in this regard, where this open letter first was very clear and significant in the sense that the long-held grievances by the Tigrayan government against the AU and how AU has handled the war, the civil war in Ethiopia against Tigray, and how AU has handled its role as a mediator to this war, and also then targeting uh, the high representative, President Obazanjo, and directing very, very, very stark criticism against both AU and President Obasanjo of, and calling them out as being way too close to Abe Ahmed's political views to be an independent mediator in the war. And uh, basically what De Brezion is saying in this letter is we reject uh, Obasanjo as the chief primary mediator. That AU and Obasanjo has to take the back seat, and De Brezion says we want, we trust in, and we want President Kenyatta of Kenya to take the front seat in the, in the mediation process, together with uh, Kenya's allies in this regard. Both Tanzania is giving a, a recognition, but uh, US, EU, and Emirates. 
So that that is a shift, and I think we we will see that. Although the chair of the AU tried to issue a statement by him himself the other day, kind of praising himself and praising Obasanjo and praising AU for what the fantastic work they had done in the mediation process, which is just a self-serving uh, hypocrisy, so to say, about bragging about what's not happened on the ground. Uh, but you know, for di diplomats, that is important. Uh, but but I think we will see that AU has been sidelined going forward if it will be a negotiation taking place. Because the Brezion is also repeating. He says that we are ready to negotiate with Abiy Ahmed and the Ethiopian government, but on the same preconditions as mentioned earlier. And these preconditions, which are non-negotiable as expressed by the Brezion, We'll see. Everything should be negotiable if you want to reach peace. But so far, these are non-negotiable preconditions. And they are the fact that Tigray will conduct a referendum on its status in Ethiopia. It's up to the Tigrayan people to decide what status Tigray should have within Ethiopia or not. That the territorial integrity of Tigray is absolute, meaning that all territories of the defined state of Tigray should be returned under the control of the Mekele government, West Tigray and territories in the north occupied by Eritrea. The third precondition is uh, the sustained existence of the Tigray army or the TDF, the Tigray Defense Forces, that the, the Tigray can never again trust Ethiopia, at least in the period we are entering now, to provide security guarantees for Tigray. So Tigray needs to maintain its army. He's also mentioning in the interview that uh, we need to see accountability for the crimes committed without defining at what level that accountability should be placed. Political top level or the chief of staffs of the army or, you know, Accepting maybe then the process of accountability the Minister of Justice Gedeon has put in place, put in motion in Ethiopia, which is pro which is mostly targeting rank and file and lower level officers. Yeah. So it is it is good that the Brezion also confirm the Tigray government's interest and willingness to direct talk with Abiy Ahmed in Nairobi. But still, both sides are playing the game of preconditions for these talks to start. So I think it is way too premature to expect talks to start soon. But it is a step forward. And this is classical. You know, um, in these kinds of wars, when both parties recognize that they cannot win by military means, and you have reached a stalemate, which are draining resources and draining and, and, and impacting the broader populations on both sides, that is a push towards accepting negotiations. And I think we have reached that point, that Abiy Ahmed acknowledged that uh, the Tigrayans are not floor to be, de de be dispersed in the wind. Uh, they are there still, and they are are a considerable fighting force which cannot be conquered by military means. At the same time as the Ethiopian economy is collapsing, which are uh, impacting Ethiopians all over, uh, and an increasing level of social unrest and social grievances will be expressed against Abiy Ahmed because of the economic collapse and the cost of commodities and the high inflation rate and so on. So Abi needs to tackle that first and foremost. And in order to tackle the economy, he needs foreign funding. And in order to get substantial foreign funding needed, he needs Europe and US on board. And hence, Europe and US will put pressure on Abi. Okay, we might come back in full force with financing your government. But in doing so, you need to establish peace with Tigray. And you need to open up a negotiation. So it is a double pressure on, on Abiy, which have led to this point. Both the fact that he has realized it is not a military solution to the war. 
and the economic collapse, and he needs help in that regard. So again, it's it's positive for a possible a possible process to start, but I'm a bit afraid the preconditions from both sides are still a stumbling block for it to actually happen rather soon. But it's talks about the talks. That's the phase we are in now. Mm -hmm. hmm. Maybe when we come uh, next uh, in the next episode, we might uh, see some developments or not. We will see. We will monitor that. Um, so let's jump in out to the number of questions. I don't know if we can cover them all today, but maybe briefly uh, touch on them. So the first question we received is on the uh, what is touched on Ola uh, and so on. So there was a statement as well regarding Gambela and Wolnega. So is this something that uh, could be factored in? Yeah, and this is also a significant event over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks um, since last time we met. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, that's both the fascination and the tragedy of Ethiopian politics. There are significant events happening every week which might twist around our understanding of our perception of tra political trajectories in the country. The fact that the OLA conducted a joint military campaign in Gambella together with Gambella Liberation Front, a new political resistance front established last year after the flawed election in Gambella uh, and actually took over substantial parts of Gambella city, the regional capital, um, for uh, almost a day, entering into the heart of the city. That's quite, that's quite significant, one must say, absolutely. Um, and then they were, they needed to pull out of the city after counterattacks by the regional and, and federal security forces. And they have also seen some gruesome uh, videos in the aftermath where civilians tied up has been extrajudicial executed and shot down on the streets of Gambella city by, by uh, regional security forces. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, OLA also conducted um, uh, military campaigns in West Wolga. So it, it indicates that they do have uh, still a substantial military capacity, which managed to, to pull off then multiple attacks at the same time over quite a, a wide area. Uh, you know, dismantling the narrative of the federal government saying that we have annihilated ULA, which they issued a statement on, was it last week or the week before? So the, the Orumo insurgency is still ongoing with, uh, with full force, you can say and um, with, with a devastating effect on civilian populations in the areas uh, affected by, by the conflict. And I think here, which, is also, which was also stressed by Javar, by the way, in his interview, the need to establish a dialogue, the need to establish negotiations with OLA to bring them in to, um, to, to stop the fighting and to stop the devastation of, uh, of parts of Oromia. So uh, it is it is a pressure put upon both the regional authorities, but certainly also the federal authorities, that the ULA campaign is broadening in this, in a sense, going into Gambella, and that the Gambella Liberation Front also is much more active. You know, certainly is an is a player in these contexts, as we have seen from a lot of other countries undergoing similar kind of transitions and civil wars, is that when a political actor which does not have a military impact or capacity to inflict military impact is not considered relevant for talks. And that's very sad. So it is forcing political opposition fronts to turn into militarily political opposition fronts in order to make themselves relevant for regional or central authorities in peace negotiations. And that's the case with Gambella uh, certainly proves that. That certainly the, the, the federal authorities and, of course, the international audience also need to factor in this this front, this actor as a as as a as a partner in a future peace negotiation and all inclusive Ethiopian uh, national dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And um, a viewer sent us on the U.S. policy talk about international <coughs> audience. Um, the viewer is asking, 
it looks like the U.S. policy towards Tigray to Ethiopia in general is preserving the unity and stability of Ethiopia, almost at any cost. But what's <clears> happening <throat> on the ground is the opposite. According to our viewer, uh, this policy is producing disunity and instability. So, in your view, what should be a better U.S. policy? I think this would work for European Union and other international actors as well. Yeah. Let me first of all say that I think both US and EU today and earlier have had a very hard time to understand the complexities of Ethiopian society and Ethiopian politics. I think they have failed utterly in understanding that massive complexity Ethiopia uh, inhabits. Yeah. So, um, and... Um, I don't know what is actually intended by, you know, what the, the content of U.S. policy towards Tigray, Ethiopia, what the, what the viewer means with that. But we have seen, obviously, that the U.S. has been portrayed as an enemy of Ethiopia by many actors today, in a sense, trying to, as you say, undermine the stability and unity of Ethiopia. U.S. was also portrayed as an enemy of Ethiopia during TPLF, EPRDF era. In many ways, you know, so that's a constant. <laughs> and I think Ethiopians in general exaggerates the, actually the influence and impact of US or EU policy towards their own country. Yes, they have a certain level, particularly certainly US, but you know, it is not that that influential in creating that massive instability we see in Ethiopia today. That's in my view, at least, is not to blame on U.S. Um, and I think certainly U.S., EU, all international actors, as I understand them, they favor a stable and integrated Ethiopia. They have different understandings on reaching that, obviously, and they have different levels of knowledge. And as I said, very few hold the necessarily in-depth level of knowledge to understand the political dynamics in Ethiopia, to actually design proper policies to help stabilize Ethiopia. And that's maybe the key issue. Since they don't understand the complexities, their policies, the policies they are designing might be skewed. And instead of helping stabilize the country, actually are tilting it further into a conflict dynamic which they they as outsiders don't see because they don't hold the knowledge and and that's part when i've been working in relation to both eu bilaterals us un agencies trying to trying to explain some of the political context the complexities the wars the conflict dynamics in ethiopia it is, it is not that often well received because it is too complex. And if the situation on the ground is too complex, it is too difficult to make proper interventions. But because to make development interventions or stabilization interventions, you need to, you need to focus very narrowly. <laughs> Maybe on one conflict dimension only. Like now, the main, main emphasis from the internationals are just looking at Mekele Addis relations. They don't factor in Gambella Liberation Front. They hardly factor in OLA. And how then can you create stability if you only look at one conflict I mentioned and not considering all the others? Because they are interlinked somehow, even though they have different political objectives in their own right. And that's 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 the challenge, yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, for the at least to my knowledge, I I don't know and well at least not European or US foreign policy actor has an agenda to destabilize Ethiopia. Quite the contrary. They have an agenda to try to stabilize because if Ethiopia disintegrates, Europe will, will, will experience the consequences of that. And also US in terms of the global or regional security uh, focus they do have. Mm. Okay, great. And the uh, next question is on Somalia. Uh, we have been following since our last episode uh, this uh, immigration uh, in Mogadishu. 
uh, I mean, all the developments associated with that. So this viewer is asking specifically on what happened in terms of the Somalia children use that were taken to Eritrea and so on. So is, he's asking, should the international community urge a new administration in Somalia to activate an investigation into the case of the role of Somali troops in genocide in Tripang? I certainly think there is a so that it should be an investigation, and that investigation is based on two objectives. Obviously, I believe that the Somali families who have sent their sons to something which they didn't know um, should get answers what happened to their children. Because a lot of the Somali soldiers were killed in Tigray. And the families have not received any information on the status. So both for the consumption of the Somali society as such, it should be an investigation into this. And the people who have recruited these young men on false pretenses should be held to account for that, meaning the former regime in Mogadishu. But the second issue is also very clearly articulated in this question that the Somali soldiers, if they have been used to commit or to perpetrate atrocities in Tigray, as the accusations are, they should also be investigated on that reason. If this is uh, atrocities uh, which will um, be a breach with um, international humanitarian law. And we hear a lot of accusations on that but that needs to be investigated and proof need to be presented against these individuals if this is the case. So yes, I do support, uh, but possibly, as I said, a joint Somali international investigation into the involvement of Somalia, Somalia military troops in the war in Tigray. And obviously, this implicates Eritrea. These troops were stationed in Eritrea and trained in Eritrea and were under Eritrean command when they were used in Tigray. So it also goes back to Isaias Abuelke's regime in that regard. Yeah. Who, by the way, is reportedly saying that um, if he's not paying the, a big sum of money, he's not returning whatever is remaining of them uh, in uh, Eritrea. So. Uh, that connection is very uh, critical. Uh, a, a big uh, bunch of the questions that we received um, are on um, TPLF, EPRDF, EPLF, PFDJ, Tigray, Eritrea uh, relations. So uh, there is a lot of question going back in how their relationship during the armed struggle, the mm -hmm. role of TPLF uh, recognizing uh, Eritrean independence and so on. Maybe we don't have to go one by one, mm. just on your take, given the, the time we have. Yeah. I think uh, to understand the conflict between Asmara and Mekle today, we need to have an understanding of the history of the two fronts and how they operated in the field when they fought together against the Derg military regime in, in Ethiopia. Eritrea as a war of liberation, Tigray as a war of resistance to topple the regime. Um, and uh, part of it harks back to mid-1980s, 84-85, during the famine in, um, in northern Ethiopia at that time, uh, EPLF under Isais of Werki, they blocked international humanitarian aid to go through Eritrean territory liberated by EPLF and into Tigray to the famine struck population of Tigray. And that was uh, created, of course, a uh, disaster in Tigray. Uh, and uh, thanks to an enormous indigenous um, mobilization, TPLF managed to establish a separate route directly from Tigrayan territory into Sudan to receive cross border humanitarian aid, which saved you know, several hundred thousands of Tigrayans. Um, but that the betrayal of EPLF uh, towards the famine-struck population of Tigray in the mid-1980s is, 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 is something which really created a breach between the two fronts. In addition to different ideological perspectives on the fight, in addition to the different military strategies they did have, fighting the war against the dirt, 
this led to a shift from TPLF and EPLF having a strategic relationship to a tactical relationship. And that is a significant shift in the tone comes to Marxist Leninist liberation movements. And that grievance between the two fronts was not settled in 91 when Eritrea militarily uh, liberated their territory and the uh, EPLF and the TPLF EPRDF took power in Addis. And that has something which has lingered that kind of both the ideological but also the grievances created during the struggle against the Dirk. But TPLF from day one accepted the fact that Eritrea's war against Addis was a war, a anti-colonial war, a war of liberation. And they accepted that Eritrea should obtain independence based on their military victory and based on then the result of a referendum, which was kept on the 24th of May 1993. I was in Eritrea at that time. Uh, observing the referendum. And uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopian government headed by TPLF EPRDF was the first country then to recognize Eritrea's sovereignty after the referendum in 1993. And I think paradoxically, as I have repeatedly said, also during the 1998-2000 war, the best guarantees for Eritrean sovereignty in Ethiopia has been the TPLF because they have consistently stood by that principle. Many, if not all, of the Ethiopian opposition parties which have existed on and off since 1993 has argued for bringing back all of Eritrea or parts of Eritrea to Ethiopia to get access to the sea, for instance, also. So more or less all the rest of opposition in Ethiopia has been has challenged Eritrea's sovereignty and integrity, but TPLF, EPRDF. And I think that's important to keep in mind also today when we see in the Brezion's presser just some few days ago, he still insists on that Tigray is not a threat to Eritrea's territorial integrity. Yes, they are a threat maybe to the rule of Isaias of Warki, but that's a different matter. So um, I think that complicated or complex relationship historically between EPLF and TPLF is something we need to carry with us and we need to factor in and trying to understand the current today's dimensions. Um, then we can pick up Maybe, maybe the first question uh, the viewer has is, did TPLF leadership reach on this, um, you know, principle through the lens of Tigray's lasting interests? Because there are many who are now, you know, maybe because TPLF, the Tigray elite, even the extending to the Tigray people are considered as enemy number one for Eritrea's so very mm -hmm. into all that and so on. So this viewer, I think, is implying that uh, maybe it had nothing to do with Tigray's interest when TPLF recognized that question. Yeah, I, I have to say that I don't think at that time, remember this was in 1991, the transitional period in 1993, when the TPLF, EPRDF were struggling to... Um, to re-establish a governance structure in Ethiopia, I don't think their position was calculated based on, you know, this is our national interest to do this in case of a war to come later and so on and so forth. I don't think they had that forward-looking view uh, as such. I think they hoped for a, a, a very brotherly relationship across Merib, uh, which they did have to start with, but which soon withered because of suspicion and the differences of ideologies, particularly Isaias of Werke's hatred against Ethiopia and against the, the federal model selected by TPLF EPRDF to be the governance model of Ethiopia. That was a, a, a thorn in the eye of Isaias from day one. So I, 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 I don't I don't think so, that it was that kind of calculation out of Tigray's national interest at that time. 
Okay. Yeah. And then uh, he talks about, or uh, the viewer uh, talks about, um, was the TPLF EPR Day of Recognition of Eritrea's Independence? Uh, I mean, you mentioned that Ethiopia was under TPLF, the first country to recognize that. Um, and of course, the international community recognized that as well. So, mm -hmm. considering that, uh, what, do you, how do you see who benefited who from all this relationship? And um, of course, uh, what role? I mean, could, could it have played? Because Rio made a very compelling show yesterday on saying that TPLF, you know, gained or attracted a lot of animosity has contributed in me uh, and partially to what is going on now from the rest of ethiopia yep. because of its stand on mm. eritrea on ndplf mm. yes as i said tplf has been the only party in ethiopia consistently defending eritrean sovereignty and integrity since 1993 and many of the other parties have, in their programs even, uh, objectives to reclaim part or all of Eritrea. Uh, particularly, again, the, the access to sea and, and the status of Assam as such. And it might be, uh, it might be that, um, you know, TPLF, Tigray certainly didn't benefit out of this, as, as you say. They have gained a lot of criticism and hatred by other Ethiopian political actors by losing Eritrea um, and uh, and also then of course the revengeist policies of Isaias. So as such Tigray has lost on both both sides for standing by Eritrea's independence and sovereignty. And uh, we can speak you know why did they do it? Well I think basically TPLF has was at that time certainly but continued to be a very ideological based party. And when the ideology tells you something, when the ideology gives an answer, you stand by it, no matter what, so to say, no matter the consequences we do see. And we saw it in the 1998-2000 war, for instance, when the Ethiopian offensive, the last offensive in June 2000, when Ethiopian forces breached the Eritrean defense lines and the commander, uh, the, the chief of command, General Tzadkan, wanted to go to Asmara to topple Isaias. Mele said, no, you just go as far as we take back the territories which belong to Ethiopia. And they let the regime be. And uh, Meles received a lot of criticism based on that ideological stand. It also was the spark which, which uh, started the TPLF dissent process in 2000-2001, which led to the split more or less of the party, which almost toppled Meles from within, and led to a cleansing out of very prominent Politburo members of TPLF at that time, and thousands of fighters standing against Meles was cleansed out by the front. So, you know, the TPLF has stood by, you know, you can agree or disagree with these ideological principles, I don't care, but they have stood by their interpretation of it and taken the consequences of that uh, for good and bad. <laughs> and that's also partly what we see today. And one of the questions here is also why didn't why didn't um, TPLF try to do a regime change strategy in Eritrea after the 2000 war? Why didn't why did they not basically assassinate Isaias, as it is kind of implied here? And that's a, that's actually a very good question. And I have to say, I asked top level TPLF leaders that same question repeatedly after 2000. Uh, particularly in the period where Isaias were the weakest, around between 210 to 213. You remember in 2013, you had the Operation Forto, the, mili the attempted military coup d'etat in Asmara, uh, where, where one contingent managed to go to Asmara and take control of the television and so on. Um, it, at that time, it would have been rather easy <laughs> for the Ethiopian government, TPLF, to assist in that coup and topple Isaias, uh, if so they wanted. The answers when I asked them, why don't you take him out, was that at that time, 
and I think it was a considered answer saying that if Isaias is taken out, we don't know what will happen with Eritrea. Because Eritrea doesn't have any state bearing structures. It's only Isaias and a handful of henchmen at the top and the military. And if Isaias is gone, Eritrea can collapse and that can create instability to Ethiopia. So it's better to have this containment strategy, as it was called. You had a diplomatic, political, economic blockade of Eritrea from Ethiopia. And to contain Isaias for not having a destabilizing role. That was the chosen preference by TPLF, EPRDF during the 2000s. Uh, today, they might regret that containment strategy. They might regret that they were not more actively trying to topple Isaias. But you know, considering the context at that time, well, it is an adequate argument saying that we don't know what will happen in aftermath. Also because the Eritrean political opposition were so divided, still are, and the Ethiopian government tried repeatedly to assist the Eritrean opposition to come together into some kind of alternative in exile, which didn't manage to materialize, sadly. Mm. But isn't it that uh, the opposition, the Eritrean opposition, groups they they say that tplf was not wholeheartedly you know supporting them just it was keeping them in maqala and you know environs but not really support them in what they want to do that is also true uh, and i think that's uh, that's uh, that's correct uh, to a certain degree that uh, the tplf eprdf uh, had an interest to uh, have a control <laughs> of the Eritrean opposition. They didn't let them free, so to say, to do what they wanted. And particularly when it comes to cross-border military engagement, TPLF prohibited the Eritrean mili military opposition, which were based in Tigray during this period, to actively engage in cross-border military operations because they didn't want to destabilize the border. A positive view in my sense, but, you know, inhibiting the Eritrean military opposition to actually do what they wanted to do. And also try EPRDF, TPLF trying to control the or influence the composition or the outlook or the substance of this broader uh, Eritrean process of coming together then for an alternative government in exile. So yes, they, they held them back, you can say. I agree on that interpretation. Hmm. Uh, I think the range of questions we received on the TPLF, uh, Eritrea, Tigray, Eritrea is uh, a backdrop, a very good backdrop to the final question of the day on what might and should might uh, might happen based on this viewer's question. So this viewer is asking why now hasn't mm -hmm. Tigray attacked Eritrea uh, mm -hmm. to break the siege? Mm -hmm. And is this something the West is discouraging or mm -hmm. is this uh, something mm -hmm. in terms of strategic value in waiting? Yeah. Well, let's take a step back. There are, if the siege is continuing, no, you have, you have to, we didn't say that. There was also a, another important event happened since last time we spoke, is the increased influx of humanitarian aid to Tigray. Uh, that is, that is, gradually increasing it's still not enough not at all enough and it's still not uh, it's still not all the components needed like fuel and so on to distribute the aid further out to Mekele. but there is an increase but if the siege is continued uh, dr de brezion and the tigrean government have clearly stated that then we need to break the siege without specifying in which direction they should go to break the siege and there are three options one option they tried last fall to go to Addis, which failed. And then there is an option going west to the Sudan border, meaning retaking West Tigray, at least creating a corridor through West Tigray to the Sudanese border to have cross-border operations, humanitarian aid from Sudan. Or they can go north to Asmara to open up uh, humanitarian aid from uh, the port of Masaba through the main road to through Asmara and into Tigray, which is the shortest and most efficient route ever. <laughs> you know, it, it only takes a few hours to drive from Masawa to, to Adigrat. So um, will they do that? 
as the questions are, why hasn't Tigray attacked Eritrea to force the regime change and break the siege? I think, well, there are two obvious key reasons for that. One is the Eritrean army is still a formidable opponent, and it will not be that easy to beat them as such. And in conjunction to that, if TDF enters Eritrea to take the fight on Eritrean soil, that might re-trigger Eritrean nationalism. Because for Isaias, it would be very easy to use then that same narrative. He has all he has peddled to his people for, for 20 years that Tigray is our main enemy, that all the worst comes from Tigray, and now we need to stand together to fight Tigray. And you could have a mass mobilization of, of the Eritrean people against Tigray to go and fight against Tigray. So and I think that that is something TPLF and the Tigrayan government does not want to create that that uh, people to people war, so to say, which will come out of that. Also, the second aspect, obviously, is that taking the war to Asmara is then an internationalization of the war. You are attacking another country. Uh, and uh, although all Western diplomats, all Western governments, We'd be very pleased, and I know that. We'd be very pleased if Isaias leave, leaves power. No one wants to defend Isaias, but still, it is a matter of going international in the war, and that's that's a that's a big step. And the T TPLF then will receive a lot of formal criticism by UN, by US, by EU, by bilaterals of doing so. So I think that is also holding them back. Although unofficially they might be told, we are very happy if you manage to kill Isaias because he's a nuisance for everyone. And we want the change in Eritrea because Eritreans are flocking to Europe. Is one of the biggest producers of refugees to Europe. We want this to stop. And we need a regime change in Eritrea. Everyone is endorsing a regime change in Eritrea, but not by military means. So I think that is holding uh, that is holding Tigray uh, back to do that, um, and I think uh, and from a military perspective, it might and certainly from an international political perspective, it is much more justified <laughs> if Tigray government reclaims West Tigray or creates a corridor in West Tigray. Tigray West Tigray is part of Tigray, meaning. They cannot be blamed to have an offensive to conquer new territory. They're just reclaiming their own territory. And by doing that, they are establishing a bridge to Sudan to, to get um, humanitarian aid in. So both from a military, but certainly from a political and diplomatic perspective, it will be if, that, if they take that stand that we need to bridge the siege, it will be easier for... TPLF to go to to get away with going to Sudan instead of Asmara. Great. Um, I, I think um, you have already touched the questions, everything. Uh, on the internationalization of the war, many people would say, as, at least from Trigai's perspective, they would say it has been already internationalized by Eritrea's presence, Somalia's, all that, and so on. But uh, you, you made your point. So I'm just. Uh, um, uh, finishing just to say from an international uh, law perspective, it is not internationalized because Eritrean involvement were on invitation and consent by Abiy Ahmed. It's an ally of the recognized mm. government of Ethiopia. Mm. Hence, it is not recognized as an internationalized war. But de facto, yes, but not de jure. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's a good point. So uh, I'm inviting our question, our viewers to send us your questions for the next episode through yemd.media.2020 at gmail. You see it on the screen. Send us your questions and uh, Professor Tromboll would be happy to address them. It's a horn peace and conflict thermometer. So anything horn would be relevant here in terms of peace and conflict. Professor Tromboll, thanks for your time and uh, hope to see you again in two weeks time. Thank you so much, Kitachu. See you next time. Have a good one.
this is uh, the end of the show. Before I sign off, uh, I will uh, announce a couple of um, shows coming up. Tomorrow, uh, we will have the Integrinya, Tigrayin Kayyih Baharin, Mr. Dr. Saruman Mazgavo. And then we will have um, uh, Dr. Van der Matt, uh, a researcher, a professor in Leiden University in uh, the Netherlands. He will be talking, speaking to the subject matter of genocidal consolidation of power, a final solution to elite rivalry. This is a very uh, interesting work uh, published by him. He was, it was part of his PhD published in a paper format as well. So I'll be speaking to him on Wednesday um, at 12 p.m. Stay tuned and then we'll uh, have that show here on the MD Media. Thank you for your uh, time and uh, please share, subscribe before you leave so that many can access our material. Have a good one.